This is Hammond. And Jessica. And you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast to support this show, get your ad free episodes and exclusive bonus episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to start by thanking a few people. Uh, Patrick, Krista, and Benjamin from the Discord server, they donated me, uh, donated some money to me. And it, again, has made a huge difference. And I love you guys and I appreciate you all. And thank you. Our listeners are the best, except the, for all the ones that leave one star reviews. Yeah. Well, I don't think we still listeners. listen to the show. What somehow. is that all about? Don't ask. Uh, no idea. No idea. Let's start this week with um, a story about a guy from Texas. His name is Matt Schaefer. Mm-hmm. He is a Texas state representative. And he recently said during an interview that. Every elected official in the country, all of them, okay. president down to like dog catcher, uh-huh. uh, they all have to worship God oh. and they have to do everything in their power to force the law to fall in line with conservative Christian ideology. I'm sorry, who is this gentleman? This guy is more powerful than us, is well, all that matters. That isn't a flex. <laughs> <laughs> He is a state representative. He's been there for a while. I'll get into his political history in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, The clip is long. It's like three and a half minutes long. You don't need to... I'm not going to play the whole thing because it is a really long clip, but here's the part that's relevant. He said in this interview, the first biblical command for all rulers and all persons in authority is to worship God. The overriding command to every person and every king, every state representative, every county commissioner, doesn't matter what level, is to worship God and to love him. Mm. All government is established by God. And if you're not doing it his way, then you're in disobedience. There's only two courses. There's obedience or rebellion. Those are really the only two options for any elected official. I'm sorry. And in this little speech, he thinks obedience is the thing that we should be going for instead of rebellion. That's correct. Apparently to be a rebel Uh in this case would be bad. But I thought their whole thing was be. No, it doesn't matter. Pretending to be persecuted and pushing back. I mean, it is always impressive to me when they break it down to terms like obedience or rebel because it's. I don't know. It just reveals some black and white thinking that they have of like, you're either a good person or you're a bad person. And it's not just, it's not good enough for this guy to be a Christian because otherwise he'd be supporting Joe Biden or something. It's that, no, 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 it's not enough to be religious. You have to be my brand of religion. You have to have my interpretations of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Then you're obedient. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a progressive Christian, you are apparently a rebel. That's too bad. Um, I hate to say that I'm a rebel because I just sort of am plotting through life, but I guess <laughs> so. It's funny that he's saying all this about one of the only countries in the world that explicitly separates itself from God yeah. in its founding documents. I mean, there are some perfunctory mentions of a higher power, but mm-hmm. the Constitution obviously rejects the idea that anyone needs to worship God, much mm-hmm. less a specific one to serve in public office. Later on in the same interview, he also offered an example of, like, Bible-based policy. He said, we have to take care of orphans, for example, which sounds very nice until you learn that his definition of an orphan is an embryo after a woman decides to go through with an abortion. No, Here's what he said. He does not mean yeah. that. How can we neglect the orphan inside the mother's womb when we have a chance to vote on people who will decide whether that is legal or not? He doesn't care about like living orphans. I mean, and he's from Texas. I'm just going to go ahead. Yeah. And look. Also, the w- Here's people- how you know he's from Texas. He previously sponsored a bill allowing people to carry guns without a permit. Oh, sure. Which, by the way, would inevitably create orphans. Mm-hmm. Um, he responded to a mass shooting that left eight people dead, mm-hmm. which also, by the way, creates more orphans, mm-hmm. by promising to do absolutely nothing to prevent future acts of gun violence. He also opposed mask mandates in the midst of COVID, which, again leaves people without their parents. Sure. Uh, That's a thing. Um, In 2022, Texas had 21,691 children in foster care, Mm. making it one of the states with the most children in the system. So, I don't know, maybe there's other actual human... Doesn't care about living people. No. Uh, He also, in 2015, before Roe v. Wade was overturned, he proposed an amendment to a bill... And had it gone through, it would have banned abortions after 20 weeks, Mm. even if the fetus had a severe and irreversible 
irreversible abnormality. It says a so lot. even if it couldn't survive, literally, right. he wanted to force women to go through with the pregnancy anyway. It says a lot about the Overton window that I'm like, oh, 20 weeks. Finally, yeah, somebody has sense around here. <laughs> I know. Um, by the way, when they were debating that amendment and when his critics, like the four Democrats in Texas sure. uh, legislature, said, you're only going to cause pregnant people more misery mm-hmm. His because ris- the fetuses are not going to live Mm -hmm. in these situations. He defended his amendment by saying suffering was, quote, part of the human condition since (laughs) sin entered the world. Oh, boy. Do you think this guy knows anybody who's miscarried in the third trimester? Does he know women? No. Because I've known two women who miscarried in the third trimester. And guess what? I don't think they give a fucking shit about what this guy thought. Like, it is these kinds of things, these sort of choices that people and usually women have to face are monumental and life altering and terrifying and and something that you're approaching without any guideposts right like mm-hmm. this is a new world and now you have to worry that some twerp in texas thinks that your fetus is more important than you a person eh. no, well thank you, not please. a person a woman oh, according I to him so remember sorry. yes <laughs> <That's> my <bad. laughs> um After Right Wing Watch post that clip of what he said, they said Christian nationalist Texas state rep uh, Matt Schaefer, yada, yada, yada. He responded to that clip by saying, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible is God's word. I reject the Christian nationalist label, but I stand by every word I said. Hashtag Texas Ledge. Well, I mean, I reject being a white lady, but unfortunately (laughs) that's sort of pinned to me pretty bad. Right. (laughs) And if there's any silver lining here, it's that Schaefer, even though he's been in office for like a decade-ish, he's not going to be running for re-election this year. Focusing on his his thousands of grandchildren. (laughs) Yes, they're sitting in the labs and ice freezers right now. A good one, he <laughs> he did say, however, he may return to politics oh. if a state senate seat ever opens up in He's his in district. State house. He's currently in the uh, state house. He's yeah, like, yeah. I'm going to retire unless, unless the old guy me. who's in a slightly higher position uh, leaves. In which case, I'll jump right back in. Uh, this is people. this is what Christian nationalism does. Yeah. When you speaking elect of these which, people. have you been listening? Have you been keeping up with telling Jeff- Jefferson lives? I have not. Oh my god, you guys, it's necessary listening it's so fucking good it's because it's literally just david barton this faux historian saying like it's a recording of his speech and then warren throckmorton paused and he's like okay when he said this he'll have to you know he he used some ellipses that left out like (laughs) the thing that said don't just ignore everything i'm about to say it's very good but anyway go ahead excellent Let's talk about uh, John MacArthur. Mm. I don't know. The genius guy? No. <laughs> very much the opposite. <laughs> I I sometimes go back and forth because this guy is a very powerful, very well-known fundamentalist, uh, Calvinist preacher. And yet, I don't think he gets as many headlines as a lot of the other right-wing crazies. I think I don't know what a Calvinist is. No. That's okay. Go look it up. Have okay. fun. So, basically, during Black History Month, he was, during his church services at Grace Community Church in California, he does Q&As. Uh, people in the church can, like, ask him questions. This is a part of church. <laughs> is it like... <laughs> Like, we would like advice on this. Or also, you're, you're like Jesus. Can you answer these questions, these moral dilemmas it, for us? It sounds to me like a psychic reading. Like yeah, one of those much. like live psychic readings. Like, I'm getting a G. I'm yeah. getting a G. Do you know anyone with a G? <laughs> Maybe it's a T. He was asked by some dude, um, how do you feel about other certain conservative Christian groups like the Gospel Coalition, which is a website that promotes a lot of fundamentalist evangelical Christianity Mm -hmm. uh, and a group called Together for the Gospel, which organizes conferences for that crowd. And he was asked, you know, what do you think about these groups? And he first of all, he called the Gospel Coalition woke, which was funny to me because I read the Gospel Coalition. They're great for material. And they routinely spread right wing, anti gay, anti trans, anti sex propaganda. But he's like, they're woke, which that word has no meaning anymore. I feel like we were done with calling everything we didn't like woke. I, know we're, they, we're, oh boy. I forgot what the new word is now, but oh they'll move God. on from that one. Uh, and then he condemned Together for the Gospel, another, again, conservative group, mm-hmm. because, wait for it, mm. in 2018, they honored Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, so he's a flat-out racist as well? <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll, so we'll talk he, about that in a second. Truly, the anti-Martin Martin Luther King crowd 
it's an impressive stand to take, I have to say. I like, thought this is a right wing fringe sort of thing. I know Ben Shapiro, Charlie Kirk, and the like have mm-hmm. been like, let's talk about why we shouldn't have Martin Luther King Day and mm-hmm. let's talk about how he's a horrible American. Right. But this is not, I mean, they're not the fringes of the right. They are the right. And now it's seeping into like church culture as well. Basically, what MacArthur said is um, I'm going to quote here uh, Together for the Gospel. They bought into the deceptiveness of the both of these organizations. Okay. They bought into the deceptiveness of the woke movement and the racial baiting that was going on a couple of years ago. Um, then he's talking about Together for the Gospel. So he's even accusing them of being out of date on their stuff. <laughs> yes. A year, they did the same thing for Martin Luther King, who was not a Christian at all, whose life was immoral. Ex- Excuse me? Oh, Re- the, the Reverend Dr. Martin That's Luther That's right. King? That guy, not okay. a Christian. I'm not saying he didn't do some social good, and I've always been glad that he was a pacifist or he could have started a real revolution. But you don't honor a non-believer who misrepresented everything about Christ and the gospel. Woof. Yeah. Uh, just to recap uh, about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Uh, like, if you want to go through his entire life history, sure, he wasn't perfect. Yeah. But... His faith-based fight for social justice and civil rights, it wasn't an anomaly. Many black leaders before him and since then, they've all used religion to justify their push for equality. Mm -hmm. Uh, One pastor at Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago now, he said in response to MacArthur's comments, if you ain't going to raise a finger to help us get the right to vote, to live where we want to live, to go to school where we want to go, keep Martin King's name out of your mouth. Lovely. First of all, wonderful. Second of all, never heard anybody call him Martin King. I <laughs> might start calling him Marty because right? I feel like we've gotten to that level. We're that close. But, I mean, truly, like Martin Luther King is like his personal life is tricky as many men's were and are. But I don't know how you can not think that he was a... I mean, listen, I've been listening to history podcasts and these sort of... Uh, transformation of Martin Luther King into the per- the figure that we know now was not an easy road. Like they declared MLK day. And I think it took like 12 years for all of the um, <laughs> States to be like, okay, I guess I'll give my students a day off for that black guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Gunning, Even if for he... his, gunning for his religious credentials doesn't feel like the way to go. If anything, I would ask why he's a doctor. Cause I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> Honorary degree. That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I should know. I don't know. Um, But even if he wasn't Christian, the values he fought for were clearly important enough that they ought to override whatever personal qualms you have with him. But the argument doesn't even make sense on MacArthur's terms. There was a writer for Christianity Today, again, evangelical publication, who said, I spoke at that conference's MLK 50, like the celebration Mm. of MLK. And I don't recall seeing any speakers who weren't unambiguously orthodox. Like, they were all conservative Christians. Oh, I see. MacArthur's accusations aren't only too lightly made, they are plainly slanderous. Hmm. So to claim... Too lightly made. I like that. (laughs) To claim MLK wasn't a true Christian, whatever hashtag, like, and therefore shouldn't be honored by any decent Christian organization, again, that is a right-wing talking point that has moved from the fringes to the mainstream to the church. Conservatives have spent years trying to discredit MLK. Now they have MacArthur joining their crusade. Like, it's not enough, apparently, that white evangelicals have largely been voting for someone who opposes civil rights at every turn. Mm -hmm. And I think since he said it and he opens the door to it, let's talk about what John MacArthur has said about MLK in the past. Oh, boy. Uh, he said on multiple occasions, for example, this was, I had to go down a rabbit hole for this one. He said, you loved it. Don't I you did. had to, you I got had to, to but had when I got there, to. yes, <laughs> he said he was preaching in Mississippi with black church leaders, including Medgar Evers brother, Charlie, the night MLK was assassinated. MacArthur said r- multiple times, some version of this story that, quote, literally within hours after Dr. King was assassinated, we were at the Lorraine Motel standing on the balcony where he was shot. I highly doubt that. You know who says that's not true? Literally everyone who was there. Sure, because, you know, it was the (laughs) 1960s. It wasn't like the 1890s. We have (laughs) photography. We have videotape. Like, truly, these people trying, like, I get 
the founding fathers lies, right? Like that's easy enough to like interpret what they had to say the way one interprets a Bible of whatever you want it to say. It's like reading fucking tea leaves for them. But boy, boy, oh boy, this is, um, this is quite a lie. So a huge lie, a huge lie. And he said this multiple times. Uh, in the book of Genesis, there is a story sure. where the character Ham curses his son, Canaan, by saying, all your descendants will be slaves. Um, MacArthur has argued that that statement, that curse of Ham, is justification for slavery. Yeah, just like they have for 300 fucking years. Mm-hmm. Like, think of a new argument, my dude. Yeah, oh, oh, wait for it. Then oh, there's God. another thing. He said this openly in an interview. This isn't like... I misspoke. He sure. openly saying this. I'm going to read this for you. There can also be benefits to slavery. For many people, poor people, perhaps people who were not educated, perhaps people who had no other opportunity, working for no. a gentle, caring, no. loving master was the best of all possible no. worlds. So we have to go back and take a more honest look at slavery and understand that God has, in a sense, legitimized it when it's handled correctly. Slavery is not objectionable if you have the right master. It's the perfect scenario, says John MacArthur in an interview. I am... Oh, my Christ. (laughs) What the fuck is this guy thinking? He's one of the most famous... I don't like fundamentalist pastors. I don't even think there's any point into in explaining that slavery was bad. Actually, I didn't <laughs> think that was a thing I would have to clarify. Yep. Wait, I thought these guys were all uh, Irish. Used to be slaves, so the Irish are having just as hard time as the black people. Uh, he doesn't talk about white people. Oh, um, um, that is one of the more upsetting things I've heard. I think. Could you read the part about a gentle, loving master? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you if working for a gentle, caring, loving master, you know, like Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hen. I. Uh, it was the best mean. of all possible worlds. So this guy thinks that what because they get and I'm using big scare quotes here, room and board, slavery is actually okay, even though they have no chance. Not of- just actually okay. Good. It's the perfect scenario. The perfect the scenario. Perfect. What the fuck? Nothing is a... could be better than. Is this okay? Here's my question: Is this just yes? John MacArthur is white. Seated racism. Yes. Or is it a a need to make yourself the good guy in history so much that you convince yourself that slavery wasn't that also, bad? Also, yes. You think both? Yeah, we'll both? there's no, there's plenty like, of overlap in that Venn diagram. Ra- uh, racism of like, well, black people can't do anything any better than slaves. So like, is that what he is thinking? I wouldn't put it past him. Or is it more of like a, he in, has in a the lot Bible, of... there's a hierarchy. So some people are kings and some people are slaves. Is that a biblical thing? I'm just trying to understand how a human being in the year of our Lord, 2023, thinks that defending slavery... It's 2024. Fuck me. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> he has also that, said, that, by the that way... That cowed me properly. Thank uh-huh. you. <laughs> he has also uh, obviously denied climate change, mm. saying God intended us to use this planet. And, quote, it is a disposable planet. He that's opened, this guy? That's this guy. I remember this guy. Yeah. I texted my friends about him to see if that's how all Christians feel. Yes. He openly celebrated the lack of social distancing and face masks in his congregation during the height of COVID. He once told a packed house, this is like soon after everything shut down, the good news is you're here, you're not distancing, and you're not wearing masks. Yeah. Unquote. Did anybody die that we know? Oh, I'll that? get there. Oh, boy. In August of 2020, he falsely claimed there is no pandemic. August. And then that October, by the way, there was an outbreak at his church. Mm. Mm-hmm. Really? That's shocking. I know. I wonder how that happened. He was being so careful. Uh, he has also said separately, no one is gay. That is a quote. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> so, hey, look, this guy's, this guy's understanding of reality... Is very warped. Just, I'm so sorry. But it's I need like, to. What could that possibly mean, <laughs> sir? I have seen gay men get married. Like, of course, they're g- I officiated my friend's lesbian wedding. They're of course, all, there's gay people. They're all lying to themselves. You can't just say something <laughs> like that. You know what? I don't believe in white men. Sorry, save it for the Q&A at the next church service. <laughs> 
Uh, Stupid. I'm telling you, this guy has a large congregation. People take this man seriously for reasons unknown, mm. uh, which well, is why with confidence. we need to discuss it. Oh, boy. I thought we would go to a happy story after this. Oh, You okay. deserve it. Do I? <laughs> My heart hurts. Um, that, oh, boy, the slavery was a good thing. Oh, no, it's just so bad. Yeah. It's just so unforgivably, irredeemably evil. And it just keeps getting worse, yes. Huh. Okay, you have a All good, right. good here's story the, for me. Here's the headline. I don't know if it's good, but it's not the same. Um, according to research that was recently published... Christian leaders around the world will embezzle an estimated $86 billion from their followers in 2024 alone. Uh, is this just the U.S. or is this global? Global. Wow. Yes. Wow. Embezzling. That's a sexy crime. And uh, the researchers, crime? who, by the way, work for the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, which is part of a theological seminary, they said... They categorize this as ecclesiastical crime. They have a category for this. And they said it would jump to $390 billion by 2050, according to their numbers. I wish I could use the word ecclesiastical more. It's a wonderful right? word. So these numbers, I looked at the paper that they actually published this in, which was published in the January issue of the International Bulletin of Mission Research, mm -hmm. which is like a Christian journal. They were actually tucked away in the middle of a larger chart. Like, this is not the thing they were writing about. They were sure. giving an overview of what does Just Christianity look data. like around the world. Um, but basically, okay. here's how the there's a watchdog group that does a lot of good work when it comes to covering how Christians are spending money, how churches are spending money called the Trinity Foundation. Mm. Here's how they summarized what this report found. Ecclesiastical crimes takes on many forms, such as skimming from an offering plate, restricted donation fraud, like diverting mission donations to your personal expense uh -huh. account or international cash smuggling. Televangelists. Whoa, international cash mm -hmm. smuggling. Televangelists have transferred funds across international borders on private jets and failed to report these transactions. Like they're going through stuff they personally wow. have written about. And we know these occur because frequently Christian leaders are arrested for financial crimes. We mm -hmm. covered one doing a crypto crime like a few weeks ago. Oh, I remember that like, guy. God told him that cryptocurrency <laughs> was the way to go. Yep. And so he started his own. Make you Give me all my money. Know what does. Yeah. It, here's the thing about ecclesiastical crimes, though. It's very hard to pinpoint how much crime occurs under the veil of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Partly, I mean, you can blame this on any number of reasons. Churches don't have to file financial reports with the IRS. They often blame crime on everything but religion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. a sin problem. It's not a yeah. problem. So the fact that well, they may we're not... we sinners, <laughs> and we apparently can't fix sin. And what happens if a church loses a lot of money because someone stole it from them? It's not necessarily something you want to go public about. Sure. So it's like tracking sales in a black market mm -hmm. of like really horrible things because the whole nature of a black market is it's out of public sight, mm -hmm. making it hard to quantify. Right. So how did they... How did these researchers calculate financial crime in the Christian world? Well, it turns out these same researchers, uh, several years ago, they wrote a whole paper about this. I'm going to read to you from this 2015 paper they wrote where they were trying to calculate this very thing. Nonprofit organizations, especially those that begin as small, under-resourced, volunteer-run organizations, face even tougher challenges in combating financial fraud. Because they often focus on their mission rather than strong administrative practices, a neglect of financial concerns can easily result. This neglect can be exacerbated when they enjoy tax-exempt status, mm -hmm. as in the U.S. Consequently, m most nonprofit fraud goes unreported. So here's what they did. They looked at data compiled by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, a, a secular that group. Like a fucking dope right? job. <laughs> so a secular group that tries to quantify like fraud. forensic accounting? Yeah. And they that group found that the U.S. economy, quote, loses approximately 6% of its gross domestic product to fraud every year. This is what the secular group found many years ago. Wow. 6%? Yeah. Wow. So 6% of our GDP is lost to fraud every year. Goes to line, line rich white men's pockets. <laughs> <laughs> so by using that metric and then looking at what Christians stood to give in donations to their church, to other ministries, to charity in general, these researchers said, 
well, let's just apply their numbers to the numbers we have and see how much fraud there might be in the Christian world. Because guess what? The Christian world is not different from the secular world when it comes to things like fraud. Yep. Like, we don't have to give them the benefit of the doubt here. Let's just treat them like any other nonprofit Mm. and see what happens. So, in 2015, what they said was, if Christians around the world gave, they they calculated, $850.9 billion to charity and $773.5 billion to Christian causes specifically, which is what they calculated, Yeah. That would suggest about fifty billion or forty six billion, respectively, lost to fraud and embezzlement. Fuck, man. That's what they found in twenty fifteen. So then they applied okay. those same numbers now. So here's what their twenty twenty four paper said with updated numbers. They said Christians around the world will give about one point three trillion dollars to Christian causes all over the world. Okay, that would result in about eighty six billion lost to ecclesiastical crime. And then, extrapolating, by 2050, they said, Christians are expected to give about $5.2 trillion to Christian causes. That's about $390 billion lost to fraud. So, again, what I really appreciate about this, it's it's all guesswork. It has to be. Mm -hmm. But they're basically saying, let's just treat Christians like everybody else and see if we can come up with some estimates. Mm -hmm. Churches are not better or worse than any other group when it comes to financial fraud, even though plenty of Christians would argue otherwise. Right. Uh, So it's a very secular way of looking at this problem. It really is. And then they also, the researchers, suggested ways to combat the fraud. This is more in their 2015 paper where they talked about it. They said, look, there are ways we could stop this in our world. Routine financial audits, Mm. more transparency, better training for the people handling the money, more oversight for any employee with access to church funds, getting insurance coverage for fraud, specifically Mm. taking action if there are any suspicions of criminal activity. Like, all of those are sensible things that a lot of churches don't do because no one's forcing their hand at it, Mm -hmm. so they don't take it as seriously. And I will say, some of them do it because... They are legit small startups. Like, they're a small nonprofit, a Mm -hmm. lot of churches. It's like, we barely have money for a secretary, and we can barely pay the pastor. You think we're going to do an audit? That costs money. Let's just assume everyone's working in on, you know, uh, everyone's best nature. Yeah. Let's assume they're taken care of. They're being good stewards of the money we give them. Yeah. We'll assume the best. Give everybody the benefit of the doubt, because they're good Christians like me. But a lot of mega churches Uh. that take in a ton of money, they don't do a good job, and like hiring someone to do an audit, making sure stuff is transparent, including with their own congregation, Mm. that stuff they don't have to do, so they don't. They limit it to a small group of people, and what happens if that small group of people decide, eh, let's do what we want with this money. There's really no way to know it's happening or to stop it unless there's a whistleblower or something. Truly. So a lot of fraud, the Mm -hmm. researchers said, or they suggested anyway, it's not televangelists spending tithe money on private jets, even though that does happen. Mm. It's often committed, they said, by people with no criminal record who make relatively little money, but they have an intimate knowledge of the organization. Sure, and how, e- like those baskets get uh, that get passed around, how fucking easy is it to just grab a 20 spot off the top? Like, or even, let's say that they're not obviously taking it from the plate, but when the plate goes behind mm-hmm. the scenes and you got to deposit the money, mm-hmm. who's to say how much is going in the church's account, how much is being used for the places the congregation thinks it's going to go to, and how much gets used for stuff that shouldn't it shouldn't be used yeah, for. Yeah, I mean, truly, if you've ever worked at a place that, like, you have to deposit the money at the end of the night at the bank, which is a kids these days. It's a real thing that used to have to happen. <laughs> yeah. The the chain of command of that money was like everybody signed it, everybody triple counted it's it. In all the that ledger, t- it truly like everything in is quill and ink. <laughs> is how I spent my childhood. <laughs> he actually worked for Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he has his outlook on life. But no one took any money. <laughs> went to Ebenezer's pockets. Yep. <laughs> Nothing for you, Cratchit. Mm-hmm. Are there any other people who worked there? Uh, just, no Cratchit. <laughs> just me. <laughs> now the question is whether Stupid. any church leaders are willing to do anything to prevent this of type of financial abuse. Because if because it means transparency, the answer is no. Because who is going to volunteer to see if they've committed, fr- like even if they don't know whether or not fraud's been committed, 
do you want to put your neck on that chopping block and be like, oh, I thought I was doing a good job, but fucking Stanley over there has been <laughs> skimming off the top. Right. Uh, Youth pastors, man. And I guess they do have a... <laughs> I guess they do have a tendency to like just close their eyes to things they don't want to see. Yeah. So it all tracks and it's all sad. Um, can I just quick anecdote? Um, my uh, my friends, uh, Justin and Megan, hi girls, are back in town from their um, Seventh Day Adventist University in Tennessee, I think it is. And apparent, first of all, apparently when they're lonely, they listen to this podcast. So hi, girls. I love you. I Study like hard. how your friends listen to this they podcast. They do. They text me and we're like, we're lonely. We miss you. So we're listening to your podcast. And then I cried for like 20 minutes. Aww. Yeah, it's really sweet. But anyway, all of this is to say I was tell- I was filling them in on some news. And apparently at their university, they heard all about the thefts at um, Liberty University. Remember all the scooters <laughs> went missing? Yes. And it was like an in-joke on campus for them. Like, no. Oh, like the fucking scooters. Like, Don't take your scooter to Liberty <laughs> when you're driving down there to see your boyfriend who you shouldn't be seeing. Truly, it was, ju- and I was just chatting with them about it, and I was like, every fucking time I heard about <laughs> Liberty, I was like, oh, you girls. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hi, girls, I love you. I would love to know what the inside jokes are at a lot of conservative Christian schools. Oh, uh, you know what I want to ask? Oh, I'm going to ask them now because they're listening. Or Can you guys bring gossipies? me like a history book that you guys have? Actually, <laughs> oh my God, when you guys are back this summer, let's do a, a bonus podcast and you can just tell us like the low key drama of, yes. of a seven you day I don't Adventist. need names. I don't know these no, people. Just tell not. me what you all talk about yeah. when you talk shit about your friends. Yeah. I would do this with anybody, but of especially course. at a conservative Christian school. Conservative Christian college, a couple of 19 year old girls. Yeah, absolutely. I want to hear what they have to say. Right. All right, girls. I would eavesdrop on Hit that. Hit me up. All right. <laughs> I saw a movie. What? Um, I know. Wait, this isn't the bonus. No. <laughs> this is the documentary God and Country, which came out recently. It's directed by Dan Partland, co-produced by Rob Reiner, which is why it got oh. some attention. And it's based on Catherine, Catherine Stewart's fantastic book, The Power Worshippers. Basically, it's a documentary that exposes white Christian nationalism. Ooh, got a 4.2 um, out of 10. On on IMDb, but eighty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, Interesante. it was good. I don't know why uh, IMDb doesn't like it. I would assume but it's review bombing. While you figure that out, um, basically the goal of the movie is to convince viewers that the mixing of white evangelical Christianity and American politics is kind of bad. Um, sure. And some of the things they point out in there, like if two of our nation's biggest conflicts were World War One and World War Two. The next one may be like, what would Jesus do? Uh, WWs. And like, basically, some people believe you have to pick a side in the battle between God and country. Mm -hmm. And to paraphrase one person who spoke in the film, for Christian nationalists, if democracy itself is in the way of achieving your religious goals, Uh then democracy has to go. And that's the... That's the fear sure, here. Yeah. And we are seeing that in action. The all GOP Alabama Supreme Court recently banned IVF treatments. Mm-hmm. Um, in a speech a few weeks ago, Donald Trump lied to a Christian audience by claiming Democrats want to tear down crosses. He said that. We do do that. He then added, quote, no one will be touching the cross of Christ under the Trump administration. I swear to you. And of course, when he swears <sighs> something, you know, you can count on him. Sure. So the talking heads in the movie, there are a bunch of people who are interviewed in this movie. They're likely familiar to people listening to this podcast. A lot of authors, a lot of progressive Christians, a lot of secular people who fight for church-state separation. They're all deeply worried about Christian nationalism. They have the academic backgrounds and the lived experiences to Mm -hmm. talk about what's happening. But even if you think it's overblown, because it is absolutely one-sided here. Sure. But the thing that I found compelling about this film is that Everything they said, it is sandwiched by, like, clips confirming every single thing they are saying. Fair. Because there's no shortage of clips of Christian right leaders saying all the things we are afraid of. Right. You have the Republican Party suppressing... Oh, Andrew Seidel is in it. He is. Um, They have the Republican Party uh, suppressing abortion rights, LGBTQ rights. There was a Christian preacher telling an audience why the GOP needs to suppress abortion rights and LGBTQ rights. Like, Mm. I have to imagine they had all these clips they could use, and then they had to decide which ones to keep on the cutting room floor because there were so many. Along the way, viewers are also told that, and this is true, abortion was not the inspiration for the rise of the religious right. That's correct. It was the desire to maintain private Christian segregated schools. Yep. You know, it wasn't, as one person said, it wasn't Roe v. Wade that motivated them. It was Brown v. Board of Education. Mm. 
mm-hmm. the way they speak of Donald Trump, not as a politician, not even as a, a bad politician, as a demigod, <laughs> but as a modern day Cyrus, uh, using whatever religious rhetoric they need mm. to convince their people he is what God wants. It allows them to ignore all of his problems. He is described by one person in the film, sympathetic to our cause here. Mm-hmm. As a televangelist, right down to the hair, who is more interested in greed (laughs) than the gospel. Yeah. Um, And the way MAGA cultists defend Trump's term in office as God's will, it makes it easier to see why they would deny the 2020 election results, Mm -hmm. why they would participate or at least defend the events on January 6th. Um, And we are told by many of these talking heads, the Republican Party's extremism, it's not a political shift as much as a religious one. And if you are keeping track of what white evangelical Christians have been saying and doing for decades, which is something we've documented for many years on this podcast, it makes sense. Everything these people are saying makes sense. It's not even new, but they're so eloquent when they say it. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to ignore so much to pretend otherwise. Right. And the thing is, you mentioned Andrew Seidel's in the Mm -hmm. film. Rob Boston of Americans United is interviewed. It's also conservatives like Russell Moore, who mm-hmm. now runs Christianity Today. David French, a conservative columnist mm-hmm. for the New York Times. You hear uh, from other critics, religious critics of Christian nationalism. Like, none of these people agree on much, but they're all united in their concerns about Christian nationalism. So even the uh, Christians and Republicans in the in this documentary are not... This far, no further. Kind right. Of. <laughs> they are not people I would look to as stalwarts of church-state separation, necessarily. But they see the writing on the but, wall. Yeah, they know exactly what the religious right is doing because mm-hmm. they are part of that crowd. Mm-hmm. These are their people. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they say it, it's like these aren't people with an axe to grind. They are yeah. people who are documenting something they have seen over the course of their lives. Mm-hmm. What I appreciate, the movie doesn't waste any time trying to give voice to the other side here. And this may be why it was review bombed or whatever yeah. it was um you're not going to find nuance much less a rebuttal in the movie i don't know that any critic would have wanted to well, participate in this project anyway and also if they're you if they're backing up their claims with like video and audio clips mm-hmm. to me i mean obviously this is a one-sided documentary but to me that at least tells you they they are pulling from reality and not just right. making shit up like the right tends to do right you can't uh, excuse away what is being said right. every single time. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not really meant to be viewed by conservative Christians who gave up on being challenged a long time ago. It's meant to be viewed by people who either don't realize this is a problem or people like us that want a good time. Um, <laughs> and to that end, like it had a small... Actually, Annie Laurie Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, she, she summarized this movie really well in an article... And one of the things she pointed out that Catherine Stewart uh, points out in her book as well, and she says this in the film, in a country where 40 to 50 percent of the people don't vote, Mm. you don't need a majority to dominate an election cycle. Mm. All you need is a disproportionately activated and motivated and organized minority. Mm. And that should be the cue to the nuns, the religiously unaffiliated Americans, yeah, to get out the vote. At nearly 30% of the adult population, there are more atheist agnostics or nothing in particulars than white evangelicals, Mm -hmm. and we are on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. She also points out one flaw uh, in the film. This is Annie Laurie Gaylor speaking. One flaw in the film is they focus on politics. They focus on the problem of Christian nationalism. There is not any criticism of the source of those beliefs, Mm. which is the Bible. Like, Without cherry-picked verses to cite, Mm. the justification of so much of this bad behavior, um, it would be so much harder to justify it. It would be harder to bring together white evangelicals if the religious right people pushing for all this Mm -hmm. could not point to cherry-picked verses to back up everything they're saying. Okay. Like, the only real mentions of the Bible coming from Christian interviewees Uh It's like Jesus wanted us to help the poor and the marginalized, which is to suggest the Bible is fine. It's just being used as a weapon by the people who want to twist its meaning. Mm -hmm. It never crosses their mind, at least not in the film, that the Bible itself is part of the problem. Because by Mm -hmm. relying on one book, uh, one interviewee said in the film, I wish Christians would, quote, go back to the scriptures Mm -hmm. as if that would resolve everything. 
And the problem here is like, stop looking at this book as the guide to your morality, period. Truly. I mean, there are, I was looking up Calvinists earlier and their thing is like, oh, we adhere directly to the Bible. And sorry, bud, every religion says that. Every religion says, no, we like, we interpret the Bible. We are interpreting it correctly. We are getting the right thing. And if one person reads the Bible and comes away thinking, oh, women are, are whores and, uh, you know, need to be slaughtered for their whatever. Like, yeah, you can turn the page and find something perfectly nice. But when you have a fucking thousand page tome to pull from, anything you say can probably be backed up by it. Mm-hmm. I bet I could, I bet I could, could make a case that there were a, aliens from interpreting the Bible. I bet wanted, I could make that case. If you found a sufficiently big enough book that covers so much content, mm-hmm. you could find cause in there to justify whatever and you And it's a to mix cause. of like narrative stories and lists of rules. So mm-hmm. it's ju- it just... Vaguely written. Vaguely written and translated to death. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's... A really hot take from us. The Bible isn't great, actually. Uh, historian John Fia, we talked about him recently because he suggested evangelical Christianity was being unfairly maligned. Oh, sure. Uh, he also did not love the film. And he's, his criticism, which I think is worth addressing, is he's basically saying this movie unfairly equates conservative Christians with Christian nationalism. And here's what he says. Uh... There are multiple places in God and Country, the film, like footage of Jerry Falwell Sr. preaching against abortion and George H.W. Bush proclaiming he is pro-life and opposed to partial birth abortion, to name just two, where the storytelling conflates politically active evangelicalism with Christian nationalism. He seems to say there is a difference between Jerry Falwell the elderly, the elder, uh, saying abortion is bad, Versus Christian nationalism. It's unfair to say George H.W. Bush, who was conservative, was supposedly Im- like implying that he was a Christian nationalist. And the thing is, the white evangelicals who want to quote their who want their faith to bear on public life, mm. they are Christian nationalists. They want to codify their beliefs into law. Does anyone think that when Jerry Falwell Sr. was preaching against abortion, he wasn't just saying, "Hey, all of you in this crowd right. who are listening to me." Don't have them. No, he wasn't doing that. He no. wants to ban all Americans from having them. Mm-hmm. When Republican lawmakers or the president says, I'm opposed to this type of abortion, I'm pro-life. What is that if not a statement of policy? Like, that is the problem here, that the people who believe that stuff for religious reasons right. now have the power to turn that into law, and they are mm-hmm. where they can. And I would like to kind of go back to the thing about who it was George H.W. Bush yeah. and somebody else. And Jerry Falwell Jerry Sr. Jerry Falwell Sr. Um, I understand that hesitation of saying H.W. was a... was a is Conservative. A, con- and he was a, a Christian. He's a white nationalist. However... Christian nationalist. Christian nationalist. Thank you. However, I don't think there's anything wrong with looking through what he said and finding lines between, like, between that and this. Like when, when right, George, you can connect the dots here. It's yeah, not it's that not hard. that hard, and it's okay. Like, fine. I would not call H. W. Bush a uh, white Christian nationalist or whatever. Like, I don't think that's a fair assessment of who he is. He dead? Nope. He's actually no. He is dead. Didn't he like? Sexually harass his nurse or something like that. It doesn't matter. I don't like him anyway. Um, but uh, no. Okay, fine. Because cr- white Christian nationalism wasn't really a category that we needed during his presidency because it wasn't what it is now. But And the Republican Party wasn't as motivated, right. except in certain cases, uh, not mis- maybe during H.W.'s time in office, late 80s. But like with George W. Bush, Mm -hmm. I mean, culture war issues, stem cell research, uh, same sex marriage, Mm -hmm. that stuff was used. And you could see that happening Um, just because it didn't have the whole movement behind it like it does now. doesn't mean those guys weren't practicing it. I mean, to me, all these evangelical, all these conservative Christians, whatever you call them, it's not like they say, well, I happen to be a Christian and that's why I want to help the poor. I want to make sure I'm helping people who need our help. Mm -hmm. It's always used to push the worst ideas they have. I think also with... Hallmark of Christian what, nationalism. Uh, yeah. I, I think another element that I see a lot is just the general concept of othering people. 
of it's us versus them. Where Christians are good, everybody else is bad. White people are good, everybody else is bad. I, I think th this othering of people is really powerful and has been used all throughout history, hashtag World War II, to do a great deal of harm by othering people, scapegoating groups. Um, so, yeah, I just don't... Yeah, that's all I had to say. <laughs> the other thing, the thing about the hallmark of Christian nationalism is these people want to take their most controversial, most despicable, most hateful beliefs and turn them into policy. They believe the law should only privilege them and their mm -hmm. beliefs at the expense of everyone else. Mm -hmm. There is no religious group outside of theirs that would benefit from what they are saying. And in fact, a lot of those groups would suffer as a result of what they're saying. If someone else's religious views, Jewish groups have said this, if their religious views conflict with what white evangelicals want, mm -hmm. guess what? Those other religious views do not matter mm -hmm. because they're not interested in, you know, uh, helping religion. Yeah. They're no, interested they're... in helping themselves. Yes. John Fia also pointed out this thing. We talk about connecting the dots. Quote, God and country leaves viewers with the impression that the slogan in God we trust on our currency or under God in the Pledge of Allegiance are somehow connected to what happened on January 6th. Um, somehow connected? <laughs> like, how can you not see, like, maybe I'm, over, like... Well played right there. <laughs> um, I mean, they are connected. For decades, conservative Christians have been using the government to advance their religion, putting in God we trust on the currency or adding under God to the, to the pledge or declaring a national day of prayer, all of which happened in the early 1950s, mm -hmm. may seem symbolic more than anything else. But as one speaker in the film said, those moves made it easier to push for more harmful policies, mm -hmm. not based on evidence, but mm -hmm. on faith later on. Like, there's no rational reason to oppose marriage equality, but there sure as hell is a religious one. Mm -hmm. And if you can point to smaller victories in the 1950s, you can justify larger ones in the 2010s and 2020s. Mm -hmm. Allowing religion to infect the government in symbolic ways forms the basis for transforming it in more meaningful and dangerous ways. And I'd like to take that even a step further, is once people like this get into power, suddenly they can control narratives, historical narratives specifically. Going back to this, the Jefferson lies, David Barton is a piece of shit, uh, who is trying to, is leading tours for religious and political leaders around the Capitol explaining how explicitly Christian their founding fathers were, which is verifiably untrue yeah but he he and his cohort and all of the like religious right is circling around him he is using his position of power to go back into history and reform what actually happened and that is dangerous and this is something fia refuses to admit but the film does a nice job of making this clear it's that white evangelicals as a whole are the problem. It's not just the 80% or so who voted for Trump in the last two presidential elections. It's the whole damn bunch who give cover to them. Mm -hmm. It's not people like Greg Locke, the hate preacher. It's also pastors who spread misinformation to their congregations mm -hmm. week after week who don't necessarily have social media helping them out. Like the same people who want to harm women, gay people, trans people, refugees... They're the same people who deny science. They spread purity culture lies. Mm -hmm. These people attend the same churches. They give money to spread these beliefs in foreign lands. They refuse to criticize their pastors for perpetuating these lies. Mm -hmm. They refuse to put pressure on those pastors to use their platforms to condemn like the right-wing shift of their congregation. Mm -hmm. Even Russell Moore, who I thought did a really good job in the film of criticizing Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. I need to repeat, he's the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, mm -hmm. which is a publication that believes committed gay and lesbian couples are, quote, destructive to society. Mm. He presents himself as part of the solution without ever acknowledging that he's part of the problem. Because white evangelical Christianity not just the Trump wing of it, right. is what is hurting us. And the people who are quoted in the film, even the, the conservative Christians quoted in the film, they don't have the guts to link those up. Mm -hmm. Like, for the most part, the people in the movie don't act like there's a difference between conservative Christians and Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. Christian nationalists, because they know there isn't one. Yeah. That's, for me, the big takeaway from the movie. If white evangelicals held all the same beliefs that are horribly disturbing mm -hmm. and did not try to codify them into law, but just kept it among themselves. There'd be a cult. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we would, would not be fun. having this conversation. We would make fun of them. Mm-hmm. We would criticize them, but we would not be having this conversation. Right. Their goal is to merge church, their church, mm-hmm. and state. Like, they need to be stopped at every turn by people who know better. So if you want to criticize that the movie is preaching to the choir, okay. But given how many media outlets and Christian movie studios and conservative influencers openly promote Christian nationalism, it's kind of nice to hear people speaking the truth. Yeah, Um, and like, it's preaching to the choir. Okay, like, I don't know what to tell you. That Sometimes that's what documentaries are. Like, they want to (laughs) document shit that is happening. And I haven't posted this yet. Uh, There's a survey that I've seen an early copy of that kind of highlights the fact that it is important to preach to the choir because there are so many Americans who have no clue what Christian nationalism is Mm -hmm. and what the harm of it is. Mm -hmm. So the more things there are exposing it, talking about it, that is important. I mean, especially this year in an election year, um, it is so huge that you have more people discussing these issues specifically. So like, what are you mad about? Well, and and (laughs) also even if, again, even if we're preaching to the choir, I'm just thinking back to like the shiny, happy people documentary about the Duggar family. This is a choir that does not get preached to very often. That also very good point. But I remember watching that. And I I think I said in this podcast, I was a little disappointed because I knew ever there was no surprises for me. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Every fucking person I knew who watched it was like, what the fuck was going on back there? Right. And so sometimes you're aware that the Duggars are weird and probably dangerous, but like. Yeah, weird is one thing. Right. But when you realize the sources and the danger of their weirdness. and people who are physically and emotionally harmed by their actions, it's it's different. And it. Oh my, I'm sorry. That really annoyed me. Like, oh, should nothing exist unless it's like controvert? Like, it's stupid. I've never what heard this guy stupid. complain about Christian movie studios Truly, preaching to the choir. What a pointless argument yeah. he's making. That's that's silly. That's absolute. This is like when people saw Star Wars. I'm like, um, it's fan service, dude. The fact <laughs> that there is a new Star Wars movie is fan service. You fucking man, baby. Yes. I don't know why I got Unquote. mad about that one. <laughs> Let's talk about something totally different. Oh. I was I was surprised by this, but we don't talk about this enough. Oh. Uh, there's a story out of India. Oh. Um, basically, the Indian state of Assam. If you are looking at a map of India, Assam is on like the upper right. Okay. Uh, very like isolated from like almost mainland India. Okay. But a few weeks ago, they've had this problem where a lot of missionaries come to their area. They've had a problem where a lot of those missionaries are like, oh, you have medical issues? I will heal you Mm -hmm. with my faith. And they're really annoyed. And they're uh, not just annoyed because it doesn't work. It's that they're trying to stop hucksters from promising miracle cures for all kinds of diseases, Uh taking advantage of gullible people Uh in need of hope. Um, And so they passed a bill passed by their legislature uh, called the Assam Healing Prevention of Evil Practices Bill 2024. And Are they the sta- like by Nepal? Uh, don't ask me geography questions. Okay, I just don't the know. The stated Indian aim geography. of the bill is to use, I'm going to quote here, here's the preamble to the bill. Okay. To bring social awakening in the society and to create healthy science-based knowledge and safe social environment to protect human health against the evil and sinister practices thriving on ignorance and ill health of people, to eradicate the non-scientific healing practices with ulterior motives for exploiting the innocent people and thereby destroying the fiber of the public health of the society, et cetera, et cetera. Like, that's what they were trying to stop. Oh, my... You know when you, like, desperately wish you had written something? (laughs) That's how I just felt. Right? And in short, here's what the bill does. It bans anybody from performing magical healing, that is the words in the text here, to treat diseases or disorders, Mm. thereby giving people a, quote, false impression of how they can be cured. It also prevents anyone from promoting those fictional remedies as if they are legitimate. Mm. And (laughs) if anyone is found breaking this law and they're found guilty in court of breaking this law, they could face between one to three years in jail on top of a fine that is about 600 US dollars for a first offense. If you do it again, you could face a five-year jail sentence and a fine that's like 1,200 US dollars. Wow. So if the goal is to guide sick sick people toward actual evidence-based medicine, Mm. 
I'm like, that's kind of good. Yeah. Good. That's respectable. I get that. I feel like the other foot's about to drop. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, this is a, this <laughs> sounds like it's a consumer protection bill yeah. more than anything else. And uh-huh. in India, especially, there are plenty of people who flock toward folk medicine sure. that offers no actual help instead of seeking out doctors mm-hmm. who actually know what they need. So by turning to religion or other forms of superstition, patients aren't just depriving themselves of remedies that could demonstrably help them. Mm. They could be prolonging the disease and giving it more time to spread. Yeah. So all of that is harmful. And they could be duped by people who just want their money. They mm-hmm. don't give a shit about their well-being. Mm-hmm. So I like that. Yeah. The problem Uh-oh. is that this bill is written so broadly that the ban on magical healing, and this is the criticism that a lot of Christians have, you're kind of banning Christianity because guess what we do when people are sick in our congregation? We pray for them. We specifically put our hands on them because we want to heal them. So they're saying this isn't about consumer protection. They're saying this is an attempt to stifle the practice of Christianity, Mm -hmm. including everything from praying for people to get better to more direct forms of faith healing. This is so funny to me. So the bill... I'm sorry. They're like, excuse me. If we can't imagine the cancer out of my friend, (laughs) then you're persecuting us. And here's the thing. I kind of want to laugh at that as well, but they're not entirely wrong here. Uh, Like the, the, The bill doesn't mention religion at all, much less a specific religion, but it is no secret that India is currently run by Narendra Modi, who is like, we talk about Christian nationalism. Yeah, no secret. He is a Hindu nationalist. Oh, okay. And his party has done a lot to basically shut out Muslims and people who are not Hindus. Hey, it's really bad. And this particular state of Assam is overrun by his party. It's mm-hmm. like, like Alabama's run by Republicans. Sure. Well, this state is overrun by uh, Modi's party. Mm-hmm. And like, so saying they want to punish Christianity more than they want to help these other people. They're not on unsolid ground there. Like, yeah, I could totally see that happening. Well, I guess this, this belies my lack of knowledge of Hindu religion, religious practices. Is there, do you, I know you're not Hindu, but mm-hmm. you are. Indian. But I'm brown. Go <laughs> on. Brown. Go on. <laughs> Let's see where this goes. Uh, is there is there a a uh, tradition of like spiritual healing or anything like that you know, in Hinduism? That, I wouldn't know, and I'm not familiar with it. But yeah. I don't remember that in any of my cultural things growing up either. Yeah, I will say folk medicine, those types of remedies, those were steeped in the culture I grew up in. Sure, but also it wasn't anti science, anti doctors. It's mm. just like yeah, yeah, the doctors say this, and we can do that, but also. Here, just use this balm and everything will be... You have a broken foot? Yeah. Let's rub this nicely scented thing on it. Sure. Everything will be fine. It's like, that's not how it works, I learned later in life. Yeah, okay. But the thing is, if they want to prevent Christian missionaries... This would do the trick because those missionaries frequently promise healing as a tool to win converts. So why are we <clears> still <throat> doing missionary work, you guys? Oh, that's a whole nother question right now. What the fuck is happening? Um, it's Christian- 2024, I now know. <laughs> there was one government official who actually said, this is the chief minister, high political position there, who said in response to this bill and why he wanted it to pass, we want to curb evangelism in Assam. <laughs> like, not we want to stop oh. the... The healing. Oh, he said the quiet part out loud He said the quiet part out loud. Uh, It's hard for me to be mad at it, though, (laughs) because I would also be very interested in not having missionaries come to my fucking country. They also said, healing is a very, this is the same dude, healing is a very, very dicey subject, which is used to convert tribal people. We're going to pilot this bill because we believe religious status quo is very important. Whoever is Muslim, let let them be Muslims. Whoever is Christian, let them be Christian. Whoever is Hindu, let them be Hindus. (laughs) Except we're totally going to stop all the rest of you for doing a thing. Mm. Um, So here's the question. What if someone is sick and their church collectively prays for them to get better? And the person dies? Well, regardless of what happens to that person, like praying for someone is not inherently anti-medicine. Are you asking how to enforce this law? No, no, no. Um, Rhetorical question. But like if someone is sick and Mm. their church prays for them, that does not mean the church is saying don't use medicine, but they are kind of asking God to play a role in helping that person heal. They're not even asking for money. They're just saying, you know, Jess is sick. We're all going to pray for you to get better. I know how I feel about that as an atheist. I'm not questioning that. It's not going to work. That doesn't do anything directly, Mm, right? Okay, but I think the difference here would be the individual who is being prayed for or healed. I think if that person feels that they... 
that they went to church whomever and said, um, my tummy hurts. And they're like, don't worry, we'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. To me, that would be a violation of this thing versus, hey, Jess's <laughs> Jess's depression is really wild this month. Go ahead and give her a prayer. Like, I, I guess the it's, question is, when does it violate then. the law? If it's an if then thing. Mm -hmm. When does this bill say a church has crossed the line or a ministry has crossed the line? Because according big? to one Christian uh, group, le their leaders are concerned that any prayer that may follow healing, uh, any prayer they do could be perceived as a motive to convert someone to Christianity, in which case, quote, everybody will go to jail. Like, they will see that yeah. any prayer for the sick is going to be treated as magical healing and subject people to the uh, consequences of this. Yeah, bill. I think what we're looking at is a, a misinterpretation of terms, right? And, like, and then the question is, is whose job big. is it? Yeah. Whose job is it to fix that? Because again, the supporters of this bill say, we're not going after your religious freedom. We're just saying, you know, if you're trying to, um, if you're lying to people about how to help them we right. want to stop that which sounds nice yeah. and the christians are saying no we see what you're actually doing here which is you're gonna say everything counts as magical healing no matter what we say about actual medicine oh, this feels like a real let them fight situation for me <laughs> <laughs> and by the way it doesn't help that the same bill also gives law enforcement officials who again belong to modi's party the power to enter any location or church where there is suspicion of healing taking place okay. and seize any evidence of non-compliance. <laughs> you bury the lead to make me look like a <laughs> fool. <laughs> yeah. And it's also worth mentioning, as as I know you know, like there are many sick people, forget religion, there are many sick people who don't always trust Western medicine mm -hmm. and they have good reason mm -hmm. not to, or they don't have the ability, financial or otherwise, to get the help they need. They don't turn to religion or other forms of superstition because they're choosing it over stuff that actually works, they turn to it because they need hope or they're desperate mm -hmm. or, and they don't have access to medicine. One Indian uh, media outlet described it this way. Christian missionaries often set up, quote, healing camps in remote areas, often far removed from the reach of adequate healthcare facilities. Uh. So you can criticize their ineffectiveness mm -hmm. or their what they're doing in these healing camps. You can criticize that all you want, but for people who don't feel like they have any other choice yeah. and they literally do not have any choices, mm -hmm. that can feel like the lifeline they need. And this bill would punish the people who are giving them something that modern medicine, as we would say, is not giving them because they don't have the resources or the access to need it. You know so, what really cure all of this is just like... Equal distribution of wealth. That would be nice. Yeah, that be amazing. <laughs> so there are if some these groups. people who are sick in rural <laughs> India could just go to a fucking doctor. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I know. I, like, so there are groups that are promising cures in exchange for conversion, mm -hmm. and they are effectively exploiting desperate people, and that's awful, and we want to stop them. But it's also fair to say that many Christians pray for people to get better mm -hmm. because they genuinely believe it will help. And they are not asking for money. They are not necessarily trashing science. And they are not doing anything that ought to be illegal because now we're getting into freedom of conscience. Sure. And to criminalize the latter, to mm -hmm. like people praying for you to get better, to criminalize that, that's which is the concern. Police territory. Yeah, that seems like an obvious overreach of the law. Yeah. And... So what happens, like, again, the problem here is that plenty of Christians, Christian leaders mm. in that part of India are like, that's totally what they are doing with this bill. I don't care what assurances they give you otherwise, but that is what they're doing. And to punish that seems like a very slippery slope. Yeah. And again, Modi's party, the BJP, they have suppressed religious freedom for non-Hindus across the country. Mm. So the accusations that this bill is anti-Christian sure. rather than pro-consumer... That is not far-fetched. By the way, in this state of India, in Assam, Christians make up less than 4% of the population, mm. and the government has already punished them for proselytizing. They have removed Christian symbols from Christian schools. Really? Like, they have gone after Christians in that community. Oh, that's not great. Um, I guess if there's any silver lining, it's that the bill explicitly defines magic healing and evil practices as acts committed by those, quote, with a sinister motive to exploit common people. And that sounds like it narrows it from people who just are well-intentioned and praying for others. 
But who gets to define sinister motive? Yeah. Like, that doesn't... If I say, I was just praying for them to get better, I wasn't trying to exploit them or any... Who gets to decide if that defense holds up in court? Right. The fact that there is a court involved. Yeah. That could be dicey. So the lack of nuance there doesn't help. By the way, the neighboring state of Assam, a different one, which has a majority Christian population... They've criticized this bill, mm. and one powerful politician in the neighboring place says it undermines secularism and targets Christian practices. All of this, they say... It undermines... Se undermines secularism, oh. uh, freedom of religion. Yeah. And in fact, India's oh, constitution protects religious freedom. Hmm. So they're saying this bill that you are passing neighbor or to our next-door neighbor state, yeah. you're violating the national constitution... But in a nation where non-Hindus have literally been persecuted, it's not hard to see this bill as a way to punish Christians mm. under the guise of protecting citizens. So it's interesting. Uh, Very interesting. That's do you, are the Jains in one specific geographic location, or is it just a it's minority It's like religion? Mormons. We are uh, oh. we congregate in certain parts uh -huh. of the country, uh, but we're not equally spread out everywhere. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump to one last story here just because I found it interesting. And it's a follow-up to something I think we discussed a while ago. Um, last year, there was an atheist who sued the city of Gillette, Wyoming. He sued them for $24,250,000. That's all of Wyoming's money. I know. He <laughs> claimed that the officials in his city were suppressing his religious beliefs because they let Christians deliver just about all the invocations mm -hmm. at city council meetings. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up, not to bury the lead here, <laughs> is that the Supreme Court of Wyoming just tossed out his case. They oh. dismissed it. Oh. Um, but I want to remind people of what this is about. <laughs> that was a jarring end to that story. I know. <laughs> the guy's name is Bruce Williams, and he represented himself in court this entire time. Oh, boy, that's a good sign. Uh -huh. um, but basically, the story here is that he said the city council holds about 24 meetings a year. And he said that roughly a quarter of Wyoming citizens are religiously unaffiliated, so you would expect there to be a proportional number of secular invocations. Is that backed up with facts? What? Which part? The 25%? He, yes, okay. that part is true. 25% uh, of people in Wyoming are unaffiliated. Okay. So he said I, he wanted to deliver two of them, possibly five or six, if no one else stepped up. Mm -hmm. But in 2017 and 2018, he did give only two invocations a year. Since then, he was limited to one a year. And basically, the city rejected his request to deliver additional invocations, but they allowed Christians, like, to take up all the rest of the time. And so he filed his lawsuit. I should also point out, Wyoming is about 26% unaffiliated. Mm. It's about 3% atheist. Oh, okay. Just to point that out. So using that estimate, atheists should be giving one invocation a year, yeah. which is what was happening. But okay, none of that mattered because that's not how this works. Mm -hmm. You don't look at the demographics, the religious demographics of your city and then say, that's how we're going to allocate invocations. I wouldn't be mad about that, though. Wouldn't be mad about that, but it's not how it works. Okay. The rule, basically, as we've seen in the courts, is if you're going to have invocations, you got to open it up to everyone who wants to deliver it and have a method so that people who want to do it can deliver it. Um, there are more religions represented in Wyoming, even in Wyoming, than the number of meetings held by the city council. So, and that assumes all these people are requesting to give indications. And mm -hmm. if they did, the city couldn't refuse them on that basis alone. But there's no rule that says the city council has to dole out invocation opportunities based on the demographics. Okay. He also, Williams here, he took a page from the Wyoming constitution that says the free exercise of religion cannot be taken away. And he said, by limiting me to one invocation a year, that's an act of discrimination. Also, I don't that think that's how it works. Doesn't feel right. Um, but. So anyway, the system isn't perfect. <laughs> I know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't quite get the lawsuit at all. Um, the one thing he had a point of saying is that the city of Gillette seemed to have a pastor's group handling invocations, even though they allowed other people to speak every now and then, which is the least they could do. Uh -huh. So, like, yeah, you need to fix your system, but it's not a clear-cut case of discrimination. Mm, and nor is it a $24 million, yeah. uh, like, uh, uh, offense. <laughs> yeah, he also pointed out in his lawsuit that uh, city council members often walked out of the room when he was speaking, sending the message... I mean, that does suck. <laughs> ...sending the message that his beliefs were, quote, nothing but horse manure. 
So like the thing is, That's they fine. have a right to leave. There's no law that says they got to listen to you speak. Right. You could argue that it's rude. I'm right. sure people would flip out if this happened the other way, a Christian speaking and a person left. But a rude invocation or a rude overreaction is not illegal. Um, but yeah. he, he, when he I told him. can't sue over decorum. <laughs> yeah, I, I told him this. And what Williams, <laughs> what Williams just, told me. I mean, you're inserting yourself in the story now. <laughs> I have to. He told me that I was wrong because oh, well. he pointed to a state law that says, quote, perfect toleration of religious sentiment shall be secured and no inhabitant of this state shall ever be molested in person or property on account of his or her mode of religious worship. His argument was that by storming out of his invocations, those council uh, members were molesting his worship, which violates the state constitution. Oh, I and I would guess. still argue that doesn't interfere with your ability to deliver the invocation. Uh, yeah. Uh, but whatever. Pure, okay. These are arguments we had last year. And <laughs> then he also said there were a couple of occasions when after he delivered the invocation, he was asked to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, which we've talked about is religious. Uh-huh. The lawsuit made it sound like the government forced him to participate in a religious ritual without giving him a chance to opt out. I don't know if that was an honest mistake or someone wanted to stick it to him. But also, like, I also think that a lot of Christians don't recognize that the, the as a religious, is religious. Thing. yeah, yeah, the under God bit. So yeah. why was he suing for twenty four point two five million dollars? Where did he get that from? Yeah. He said oh God. that this quote conspiratorial oppression oh has occurred ninety seven times over the course of several years. And each instance uh, carries with it a $250,000 fine, which is the maximum penalty in the state for a violation of civil law. Well, he he did his homework. I'll give him that. He did. (laughs) He believed there needed to be a significant financial penalty to stop officials from doing all this in the future. And then he told me, and I'm quoting here from him because I asked him about this. I'd like to get the $24 million. Half of that would be my goal, just so that they know the next time they pull a stunt like this, it'll hurt them again. Um, but okay. as expected by me, the <laughs> foremost legal mind in all of this uh, at this table, at this table, <laughs> turns out no judge bought any of this. Yeah. Um, it doesn't <laughs> feel right. <laughs> yeah. It didn't quite work. Um, last year, a lower judge basically tossed it out. Um, and he basically rejected it on a technicality. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics because I'm going to screw up if I try to explain the technical reason. But he basically said, this isn't going to work because you're not even using the right citation in this argument you were filing by yourself. So I'm not going to get into... You always have to hire a lawyer to, like, review your work, bud. Yeah. Um, Like, do what you have to do, but, you know, And then he appealed it to the Supreme Court... And this week, they issued a five-page written opinion, which said, yeah, the earlier judge was totally right. That took five pages for them to say? took five pages. What the Supreme Court said this week is that the city and mayor have sovereign immunity from being sued because you didn't like something that they did. You can't sue them for acting in their course of business and doing something. That feels right. Now, if you want to do that, there is a law that says the state's legislature can provide some exemptions Mm. to that so that you can sue them, but that's something you got to go through the legislature for. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, But you can't sue on the grounds that you are suing for right now in your argument. So that's why the Supreme Court said, yeah, the earlier court was right. You screwed up on how you did this. Mm -hmm. So we're not even ruling on the merits. We're saying you're choosing the wrong venue to go through. There are better things you could cite. Mm, Interesting. And the justices wrote, I'm going to quote here, Mr. Williams asserts direct constitutional claims against the mayor and city officials because there is a law that does not permit these claims against elected officials, the district court did not err in dismissing his complaint for failing to state a viable cause of action. So you did it the wrong way, buddy. Uh, So (sighs) that is what they argued. So I asked him, what are you going to do now? Uh, And basically what he told me is uh, he's probably going to refile his lawsuit in about three to four months, but he will take a different approach. Mm. He said, in not going through the legislature, because good luck with the Wyoming's very Republican legislature, sure. but he said he might go through the federal courts instead, and then he'll ask for a larger penalty per violation. Oh, uh, it is, oof. Um, you know, this guy is tilting at windmills and good for him. It does say something to me that, like, FFRF didn't, stick their hand in this. Well, he didn't ask them to, which but, is that too. Uh, sure, but like I feel like once it got once it started to make news, 
somebody's if you have a viable case, somebody's going to reach out to you, right? I mean, obviously, that's not the the measure of whether or not FFRF would only take this case if someone asked them to, for what it's worth, or they felt it was a federal case. And if this was a state thing that this guy is doing by himself oh, and I not see. asking for their help, they wouldn't get involved. But I get your point that like. He's doing this solo. Yeah. And again, if he can do it solo, he's not the first person to think, I can do this myself. I I don't know if he's a lawyer or not. He may be. But even the fact that he thinks he can fight this on his own, fine. But he did say about the state's dismissal of his case, he told me, if you have a constitutional right, but no way to enforce it, you literally have nothing but a piece of toilet paper. That doesn't mean, even let's say he loses all the way through, doesn't mean this was all for naught, because Mm -hmm. if the purpose of invocations is to bring people together, the fact that he filed this lawsuit shows it's not working. Mm -hmm. And by not having a more transparent way for people to sign up to speak, the city is kind of creating its own chaos. Sure. They could fix this by putting together easy-to-understand policies that don't involve outsourcing invocation speakers to Christian leaders. Mm -hmm. They could get rid of invocations. Mm. So if nothing else, a lawsuit highlights all that. I just don't think he's going to win. Yeah, I mean, I guess how often are we talking about Wyoming state letter, legislature? Legislature, yeah. Oh, boy. So anyway. Wow. That was a lot. That uh-huh. was an action-packed... Um, Good times. Action-packed thing. What are we going to talk about in the bonus? Oh, probably mostly the Oscars. Um, but also, before we go... I also want to talk about Katie Britt. We did not Who? talk about... Oh, the hey. response to the State of the Union. Because uh, oh. there is a religious angle to that, too. Oh, fun. Do you want to talk about the bonus? Or yeah, we'll just, talk about it in the bonus. You're just talking about how we're not going to talk about it. No, we will um, talk about it. And the reason I'm not talking about it here uh, is I plan to talk about it more uh, in a week or two oh, okay. on this podcast. So we're not ignoring the topic entirely. I see. Okay, um, before we go, um, I am going to be in Bloomington, Indiana next weekend. So the 22nd and the 23rd. Um, I'm meeting my friends from Louisville up there. Um we're going to see Sarah Sherman, who's a comedian from SNL. She's awesome. Um, <laughs> we all bought our tickets, um, and then one by one, a lot of people started dropping out. So we have some extra tickets to the 9 o'clock or 9.15 Sarah Sherman show. I know this isn't the place to, like, scalp, but <laughs> I don't know what else to do, and this is my only <laughs> my only outlet. Um, also, we're probably going to do, like, a little mini meetup maybe before the show. I haven't decided because my life is fucking chaos. Excellent. Um, um, but and you could support this show yes. at oh. patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast. You could leave us a review on iTunes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Your review might be read by yours truly, and it might sound something. And it better be a five like star. This perfect. Have review. we done the Reading guy? No. Yes. Um, I've done. Oh. Yes. Love yes. the dynamic between Jessica and Hemet. Did we do that one? It doesn't matter. Some nice ones. Um. Let's see. Hemant brings interesting things to light, and Jessica's reaction to them is so real, and she brings much appreciated feminism and humanist perspective. Thank you. Uh, I hope they see this and bo- know they're both wonderful and appreciate their efforts. Oh, we did see it. Thanks. We read it. Thank you, Maui Pickle. <laughs> um, Excellent. Cool. We'll see you all in the bonus. Goodbye.